Welcome to Babel, Translating the Middle East, a podcast from the Middle East program at CSIS. Here on Babel, we take you beyond the headlines to take a closer look at what's happening in the Middle East and why it matters. After Hamas fighters broke through the high-tech fence around Gaza and killed more than 1,400 Israelis, the Israeli government declared war. Israeli jets have pounded Gaza and ground forces have begun to seize land. Authorities in Gaza say more than 8,000 Palestinians have been killed and violence is set to rise. This week on Babel, I talked to analyst and journalist Nuri Zilber about the war in Gaza, how Israelis are thinking about what comes next, and what it means for the region. Then I continued the conversation with Natasha Hall and Leah Hickert discussing Arab states' reactions to the conflict and what the war might mean for Palestinian domestic politics. To translate some of what's happening in the Middle East, this is Babel. Neri Zilber is a journalist based in Tel Aviv, an advisor to Israel Policy Forum, and an adjunct fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Neri, welcome to Babel. Thank you, John. Good to be with you. I've heard a number of people say that Joe Biden is now the most popular politician in Israel. Do you sense that? And what do you sense it gets him? Biden is definitely by far the most popular politician in Israel, especially amongst the Jews, for everything he's done over the past three weeks. Obviously, you're your listeners are probably aware of the very strong, both rhetorical and military positions he's taken since the outbreak of war after the October 7th Hamas assault on southern Israel. So very quickly came out in support of Israel and also very clearly warned Hezbollah, Iran and various other Iranian proxies all around the region. And his words, don't, don't get involved. So that was rhetorically and then obviously militarily moving massive, massive assets into the region, whether U.S. carrier strike groups, Marines, air defenses, and the like. So in and of itself, that was remarkable, both in just the quantity and the speed of a U.S. president and administration taking those actions in defense of a close ally like Israel. But also he came here. He came here a week and a half ago. So a U.S. president during wartime coming here and very clearly embracing both Israel and really the public. And so the Israeli public has responded. What does that get him? What does it get him? I think strategically, if you look at U.S. policy in the Middle East, he didn't have a choice but to take this forceful action, to my mind, not only due to the fact that he and almost every other previous administration have said a core U.S. national security interest is the security of Israel. So this was a very, very hairy time for Israel, just in terms of its basic security, if not survival. I mean, it may sound overblown, but that was the feeling really on October 7th and in the aftermath. So in and of itself, it's a reaffirmation of that commitment. And then also U.S. posture in the region. If he doesn't come to the aid of Israel in its most dire moment, arguably since its founding, then America's other Arab allies will further question U.S. commitment to them if they come under an attack by various Iranian proxies. So the U.S. government has been increasingly vocal about the need to have an endgame in Gaza that Israel has to fight at the beginning with the the end in mind. How is that resonating in Israel? So it has resonated, and I've reported about on this for the Financial Times. We took a hard look at what Israel was at least trying to plan in terms of the end game, both an exit strategy for its troops from Gaza, as well as what Gaza would look like post-war. And if the inclination, at least by some Israeli leaders in the direct aftermath of October 7th, was just to essentially send in the tanks and then figure it out afterwards. I think Bibi Netanyahu's national security advisor, Tzachi Negbi, had a line, I think that first week said, you know, we don't know what's going to be in Gaza the day after the war, but we definitely know what won't be in Gaza the day after the war. That's a nice soundbite. As sound policy, it's questionable. And so what you saw really when this emergency unity government was formed and really the formation of the war cabinet that is actually prosecuting the war on the Israeli side with Benny Gantz and Gadi Eisenkot, two opposition politicians, but also two former IDF chiefs of staff joining the war cabinet. Their two core demands was to precisely figure out, okay, how do we extricate ourselves from Gaza when our objectives are met? And what will a post-war order for Gaza be like? To the best of my understanding, the Israeli system, both the official military system, but also outside the official system, are trying to figure out what the best course of action will be. No decisions have been made yet, but as some people told me, figuring out an endgame for Gaza 
should very closely be tied to the actual prosecution of the ground offensive. And so you have to figure out what you want to see on the other side to figure out what you want to do currently on the ground. I remember after 9-11, Israeli counsel to the Bush administration was really important to the Bush administration. Ariel Sharon had a very strong relationship with President George W. Bush, and a lot of it was based on Israel's experience fighting terror. The United States now has spent 20 years fighting insurgencies in the Middle East. I think the Americans' view is they have a lot to say to Israel that's relevant about fighting insurgencies. Do you think Israelis are receptive to that now, or might they grow more receptive over time? Or is there a sense that the U.S. experience in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places just isn't relevant? So I think the Israeli system is very receptive for the simple fact that they have to be receptive, given the massive amount, like we said, of U.S. diplomatic, political, and military support in this grave moment. Things here would look very different right now if the Biden administration had not taken those steps. And that's a fact. I think Israel very much understands that. Even far-right wing Israeli politicians who a few weeks ago were poo-pooing Biden administration comments about this or that issue now realize that Israel is a lot more reliant on America on a whole host of issues than even they wanted to understand and admit prior to October 7th. And we've seen reports of you know not just U.S. generals, but also obviously close advisors like Tony Blinken and Lloyd Austin coming here and spending several hours sitting with the war cabinet and other senior officials, you know, trying to figure out exactly how this war is going to play out. So there is receptivity. Are the lessons from 9-11 in the past 20 years of America's wars in the Middle East a one-for-one comparison? I have my doubts. I think there is a huge difference between expeditionary wars thousands of miles away from home, like America launched in Afghanistan and Iraq and other places, and what Israelis consider a battle, as they say, for our home. I'm sitting in Tel Aviv. The border of Gaza is 40 minutes down the road, right? And the thousands of Hamas terrorists and commandos that flooded across the Gaza-Israel frontier, it took them only a few minutes to reach the kibbutzim, moshavim, communities of southern Israel. And so I think in terms of both strategic assessment and strategic risk, and also just motivation by Israel to prosecute this war. I think that's very different than what we saw post 9-11. There may be lessons learned in terms of urban fighting and the U.S. experience in Iraq. But again, here as well, there's a huge difference between sending in soldiers and tanks where some of the soldiers may live 30 minutes away. The Air Force, it, it takes them just a few minutes to take off from a base and reach Gaza. So also in terms of military tactics and operations, it's a different proposition. But we should say Israel should figure out how it wants to prosecute this war, what it wants to see on the other side of it, and not go like perhaps America did after 9-11, seeking revenge against enemies that did grave harm to it, and then indefinite occupation, indefinite quagmire in enemy territory, fighting an insurgency. That's one result Israel does not want to see. What's the Israeli reaction to the images of the war? Is it a sense of, look, we've seen war before, we've fought wars before, this is what wars are like? Or is there sort of a sense that maybe the civilian casualties are not helping Israel in the longer term? Or is there a sense of, it's just inevitable? So I'll preface my answer with the images we saw on October 7th from southern Israel, just on the terms of the Israeli casualties and what was done to the vast majority of Israeli civilians, including babies, children, women, and the like, was nothing Israel had ever experienced before. And Israel has uh, a long history with conflicts and wars going back even before its founding. So in and of itself, that was very jarring, very shocking. A lot of those communities in Kibbutzim and Moshavim, what they call the Gaza envelope, basically the frontier of Israel with Gaza, they were very left-wing. A lot of peace activists were either slaughtered or being held right now in Hamas tunnels as hostages. So again, that in and of itself, very jarring, especially to the Israeli center or left. In terms of the images coming out of Gaza, look, it depends which Israeli you talk to. I imagine, and I've heard this firsthand, some more right-wing or ideological or hardline Israelis say, you know, good, they had it coming, you know, more needs to be done. Not enough damage is coming out of Gaza. The more reasonable Israelis say, look, we have a lot of empathy and sympathy for non-combatants and civilians in Gaza that are living under the yoke of this dictatorial extremist regime, Hamas, that has controlled their lives now for over 15 years. But there's no real alternative because Hamas very purposefully 
puts its military installations either in or under or next to civilian infrastructure like hospitals and mosques and schools and like. And this is not an Israeli talking point. It's a fact. I mean, it's a very well-known fact, you know, Shifa Hospital in Gaza City. Underneath it is Hamas's main military command and control center. I know that firsthand, not from Israeli sources. So all that being told, you know, obviously it's a very difficult situation, but for the Israelis, they say, look, this war was imposed on us. And again, we can talk about Israel-Gaza policy going back to the Hamas takeover in 2007. But the Israelis, you know, intuitively understand that even if they're not privy to all the ins and outs of the policy, and that, you know, there's no choice. This is a war of no choice that was imposed on us, and our hearts may go out to the Gazan people. Again, that may be a minority position amongst Israelis at this point, given what happened on October 7th. But really, there is overwhelming wall-to-wall support for the war, and also, by the way, for a ground offensive, which will make things in Gaza, I imagine, much more difficult than what we've seen over the past three weeks. As you remember as well as I do, the first intifada eventually led to the Oslo Accords. What do you think would need to happen for the current war to lay the groundwork for some sort of political settlement? I have heard, not publicly, but in my conversations with some Palestinian officials, both Israeli analysts and also international analysts, the understanding that, look, this war will eventually end somehow. All wars do come to an end. What will the other side of it look like? Not just vis-a-vis Gaza or Israel-Gaza relations, such as they may be, but the entire Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And you hear these voices, again, not publicly, say this has to be an opportunity to really rethink the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, not just through the prism of Israeli policy, although that's hugely, hugely important. So a lot of them say, look, under this current far-right Israeli government, not too much hope for a shift in policy, say, vis-a-vis the West Bank and, you know, continuing expansion of West Bank settlements, but a new and future Israeli government that will almost certainly be more centrist and more moderate, maybe there will be movement and a deeper appreciation that the status quo clearly did not hold in terms of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, no matter what Bibi Netanyahu said just a month ago at the UN, that we're resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict, and yeah, there might be outstanding issues with the Palestinians, but they'll eventually come around. That blew up in the worst way possible just a few weeks ago. And there's also an understanding that this can't just be, say, Israel-Gaza policy or even Israeli-Palestinian policy shift as much as that is needed, but really a regional and international prism through which to actually try to improve things after this war ends. Is there any discussion or has there been any discussion that could be invigorated about the need to strengthen the Palestinian Authority? I mean, when I interviewed the Jordanian foreign minister last week, he described it as crumbling, which for a diplomat is quite a statement. Yeah. And look, let's not mince words. The policy by Bibi Netanyahu, who's been essentially prime minister of Israel since 2009, was very clear. He was going to weaken the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, very purposefully so. No peace talks, no negotiations, you know, begrudgingly give aid, but usually take away aid, more settlements and the like, while he was indirectly negotiating with Hamas via Qatari and Egyptian and UN mediation. He was very willing to give, as they say, suitcases of cash to Hamas and other economic and financial and humanitarian inducements for Gaza because they fired rockets prior to October 7th. That was what they were doing. Negotiations via rocket. And they extracted concessions from Israel, whereas the actual moderates, the proper moderates in the West Bank, in the Palestinian Authority, were essentially taken for granted, shunted aside. Security coordination between Israel and the Palestinian Authority still continues, by the way, to this day. And that was essentially taken as a given. This will always last, and so on and so forth. So again, if we're talking about a real paradigm shift in Israeli-Palestinian relations, I think it has to start with the understanding. You have to support the moderates, and you have to, again reform the PA. That's also an onus on the Palestinians themselves. And there are people working on various ideas. But really, you know, the idea of the Palestinian Authority moving into Gaza and retaking control post-war after Israel, quote unquote, destroys Hamas, as one Palestinian told me, you know, Abu Mazen, Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian Authority president, can barely control Ramallah these days. How is he going to control 2 million people in Gaza? So again, if that's an end goal, then you have to start working now to actually support the Palestinian Authority, you know, led by Mahmoud Abbas or not, to actually do the job, easier said than done, which is why it's so difficult to actually put together right now a coherent post-war plan. Is there an Arab role 
in this? And what do you think the future of Israel's relationships with Arab states is going to be? Does the need to strengthen the Palestinian side, as you've described it, provide an avenue for a different focus for Israel-Arab relations? I believe so. I think the Israeli public has been shocked at the Arab reaction, both on the governmental level and just the general public, to this war in Gaza. The assumption here by many, obviously clearly wrong, was that the Arab world and especially the Arab leaders don't really care about the Palestinians, especially you know the Gulf Arabs and the like. We've seen their statements, very, very strong statements in condemnation of Israel. Now, again, it doesn't mean they're going to break off relations or cancel peace or normalization agreements, but it's taken the Israeli public and even, I'd argue, the Israeli government by surprise. Look at Turkey and Erdogan. There was a rapprochement going on now for the past year, and now he's he's holding mass rallies in Turkey, blasting Israel as a war criminal state and saying that Hamas isn't a terrorist group. So again, I think it requires a major rethink on the Israelis' part. The Palestinian issue still obviously and clearly resonates. And also, in terms of an Arab role, yes, I think the only way Gaza will work post-war in whatever state we find it will be with Arab equities, both political, diplomatic, financial, maybe even boots on the ground in terms of having a force that is seen as credible and legitimate amongst the local population in Gaza, actually upholding security. So I imagine these are talks that are ongoing. And if it wants to get there, then it will likely have to make a serious 180 degree shift in its bigger Palestinian policy to actually show both the Palestinian public and the Arab world, that while we may have had a major issue with a terrorist group running the Gaza Strip, which now we're taking care of, this isn't a war on all Palestinians, and that our face as Israel is towards actual peace and actual coexistence, and not, well, war on all fronts. As I don't have to tell you, Israelis have tremendous respect for their military and intelligence institutions, which arguably had a profound failure on October 7th. What do you think the military and the intelligence apparatus in Israel is going to have to do to regain trust? I've heard a lot where they seem to have an instinct to blame the politicians. Do you think they're going to be able to stick this on the politicians? Would the politicians blame them? How does this play out? In fairness, all of the security chiefs have gotten up there and said, you know, this is a massive, massive failure and we are responsible for it. And the growing assumption, and it's almost a certainty, a lot of these security chiefs in post right now will resign voluntarily at the end of this war, whenever it ends. And I'd argue rightfully so. I'll say two things. Number one, there's huge anger, both, by the way, from within the Israeli security establishment and the general public. How could this happen? This massive intelligence and military apparatus was overwhelmed by a few thousand Hamas commandos. They didn't see... Toyota pickup trucks and motorcycles coming at the border fence in Gaza. It wasn't stopped. It took hours for forces to actually respond. So the trust has been broken. They're trying to mend it. And there is kind of a rallying around the flag effect. Now, hundreds of thousands of Israelis have mobilized for the reserves. There are reports of you know over 100% reservists reporting to their units. But yes, the biggest shock, aside from the actual atrocities and barbarity perpetrated on October 7th, is the fact that it actually was able to happen, because that was not viewed as even possible. And then in terms of military political relations, there are strains. We saw it even over the past 24 hours. Bibi Netanyahu was very clearly wanting to place all the blame on the security establishment and the intelligence services, but the one actually managing and overseeing this entire system for the better part of the past 15 years was Netanyahu. He should take responsibility. And I'll just say that everybody got this wrong. A month ago, I was sitting in a briefing with senior Israeli security officials, and they were talking about all kinds of things. They were talking about the Iranian nuclear threat. They were talking about Hezbollah a little bit. They were talking about you know various kind of shiny new billion-dollar weapon systems. And then the Q&A session, I raised my hand. I said, like, hey, by the way, why are we seeing renewed protests and riots on the Gaza border? Why haven't you actually talked about Gaza? So in terms of priorities and just what people here say, you know, the arrogance that led to complacency, right, and overconfidence, they essentially did not take Hamas seriously enough. They got it very, very absolutely wrong. And there's a big focus on the West Bank, 
which arguably is an even more complicated security problem for Israel because Palestinians and Israelis are living cheek by jowl and not separated by the same kind of border that separates Israel from Gaza. How worried are you that the West Bank is tinder that's going to burst into flame? Extremely worried. The West Bank has not been calm. It's less in the headlines. But no, I think since October 7th, 100 Palestinians have been killed either in clashes with Israeli security forces or by extremist settlers who are taking the opportunity to do the exact wrong moral and illegal thing, which is attack Palestinians. So it's very concerning. We've also seen demonstrations not only against Israel and not only in support of Hamas, but also against the Palestinian Authority, chanting against President Abbas by name. It's hugely concerning with the one caveat that it could have been worse. It could have been worse. The protests could have been bigger. The unrest could have been wider. The Palestinian security forces are still unified and maintain some semblance of order. If you remember back to the beginning of the Second Intifada in the early 2000s, the Palestinian Authority security forces and the Fatah party militia, you know, writ large, they joined in that terror war against Israel. We have not yet seen that. We have not yet seen that. And I think that's a credit to the PA and the PA security forces, because again, that wasn't a given. It really needs to be tracked very closely. But as yet, things are, I hate to use the word relatively stable, because they're not stable at all. But, you know, it hasn't gone to complete chaos, complete violence and complete breakdown yet. Let me ask you an unfair question, which is to use your crystal ball and to answer, where do you think Israeli politics are going to be in six months? Presumably, military operations will be in a very different phase. Presumably, there will be a great deal of progress on accountability for the failures of October 7th. You talked about how a lot of the current security leadership is likely to move on. What happens to the right-wing trend in Israel? What happens to the center? Is the left invigorated at all, or does the left remain humiliated, embarrassed by the massacres of the kibbutzim and moshavim in the Gaza envelope? You know, nobody knows what's going to happen here tomorrow, let alone in six months. But I'll say a couple things. Number one, Netanyahu is almost certainly finished. He's still walking around and talking and trying to act like he has a political future. I don't see how he survives this. So in and of itself, that will be a tectonic shift, obviously, in Israeli politics. I don't think this current government is long for the world. Again, they were in charge. And also, by the way, not just on October 7th, but in the weeks afterwards and the near total absence of governmental support and responsiveness. It's almost all been kind of civil society and just regular Israelis filling the void in terms of helping the displaced, donations and the like. It really is, they say, you know, we have a terrible government, but a great society. That's kind of the unofficial motto, you know, great nation, terrible government. So I don't think they're long for the world because they were responsible. That's maybe on the more positive side of the ledger. On the Less positive side of the ledger, I think October 7th set back Arab-Jewish relations between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River decades back. And you hear it not just from kind of right-wing Israelis, but even centrist Israelis, even left-wing Israelis or formerly left-wing Israelis who were shocked. The atrocities they committed, even Israelis didn't think was possible. So in terms of just Arab-Jewish relations, very, very damaging, and it'll take a lot of work to repair I'll just say for your listeners, it really is interesting to look at a publication like Haaretz, which is very left-leaning in Israeli terms, and just see what their columnists and writers are putting out. I'm not saying they're all of a sudden right-wingers, but they're putting out, okay, this war is a just war and Hamas needs to be taken care of, while at the same time, you can be still very for ending the occupation you know, and into settlements and the like. That'll be a very fine line to walk. But my hope is that after this war is over, that a more centrist Israeli government will rise. And through that, a lot of more things will be possible in terms of positive change here and kind of marginalizing the far right, which Bibi Netanyahu brought into the center of the political map. And also hopefully keeping alive the prospect for actual peace and actual coexistence here, which has been obviously the flag of the Israeli left. Hopefully that wasn't destroyed on October 7th. And by the way, even if Hamas is destroyed, at the end of this war, maybe they would have won the kind of bigger campaign to actually make sure that there is never actual peace 
in the Holy Land. And so people who actually care about the actual people living here need to push back against that, regardless of the ongoing war or as part of the ongoing war on the ground militarily. Is there any contemplation in Israel that this war might not end in victory? It might end in a sort of messy, unsatisfying stalemate the way a lot of American military operations have ended in the last several decades? You know, there is a concern, arguably unlike any in my lifetime. But at the same time, we also have to be realistic. October 7th, as one very senior Israeli politician told me the other day, it was obviously a clear military defeat, but it wasn't because Hamas was militarily stronger than the IDF. It just was the IDF was, you know, overconfident, arrogant, didn't deploy its forces properly, didn't read the intelligence properly. So now that the entire IDF and security service and the country is on a war footing, presumably it has enough both firepower, resources, and smarts to actually defeat a terror army like Hamas in a very limited territory like Gaza. That's the hope, at least. But the issue from my perspective is in the United States, one could argue that the military has fought several wars over the last several decades, but it's been a long time since it decisively won one, not because it doesn't have smarts and firepower and all those things, but because the tasks it was trying to accomplish went beyond the military realm. It went beyond battles. It went toward the will of the adversary and all sorts of other things. I mean, the fact that the Taliban are now in power in Afghanistan is not because the U.S. didn't put enough money and troops into Afghanistan. Right. And look, it's a well-taken point. And, you know, come talk to me in two or three years if the IDF is still sitting in the middle of Gaza City fighting a bloody insurgency, you know, then the public mood may shift. But again, going back to what we were talking about earlier, there's a huge difference between an expeditionary war in faraway Afghanistan or Vietnam before that and the like, and fighting what many people here view as an existential struggle against a terrorist enemy, very literally on your border, just across the fence of your community. So presumably the staying power of both the public and the military and the government will be longer standing than America's examples, which is, we both know, yeah, America could have kept dumping money and personnel into these wars, but the public support for doing so back home, whether in Washington or all across America, was really what decided the policy shift in the withdrawals. So as long as the Israeli public believes that the war aims are both achievable and worthwhile, you'll still maintain support, again, depending on what happens on the ground in Gaza, obviously. Neri Zilber, I'm going to take you up on that offer to talk in, in two or three years, and I look forward to that. Thank you very much for joining us on Babel. My pleasure, John, and hopefully I have better, better news in two or three years. On one hand, Neri said that if President Biden didn't come to Israel's aid, then other U.S. allies in the region would have doubted U.S. commitment to them if they were ever attacked by Iranian proxies. On the other hand, President Biden's outright support for Israel has caused a lot of unrest among Arab populations. John, you spoke to the Jordanian foreign minister the other day. How do you think Arab leaders would have liked President Biden to handle this situation? Well, there's what they'd like in private and what they'd like in public. In private, virtually all of the Arab governments despise Hamas and want Hamas destroyed. Their problem is that they both personally and politically are very supportive of the Palestinians. And I think while they'd like the U.S. to support allies, they also don't think that the United States should be supporting allies going marauding against Palestinian civilians, which is precisely the way most people in the Arab world perceive what's going on. Look, I think the reality is that most Arab governments have been deeply critical of U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East, regardless of what the U.S. has done. They've both wanted U.S. military action and decried U.S. military action, sometimes the same military action. I do think, though, that the extent to which President Biden initially went all in with Israel and the slow pace with which the U.S. has talked about the importance of protecting Palestinian civilians has rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Interestingly, I think that the the inflection point in much of this was at the hospital bombing, which it turned out Israel wasn't responsible for. We're almost certain of at this point. But 
the fact that there would be an inflection point, I think, was likely. And, and I think the United States has been struggling to find its voice. President Biden's voice was very clear on supporting Israel. I think his, his voice on Palestinian civilians, on legitimate war aims, and to me, the most important thing, which is the centrality of separating Hamas combatants from the population in which they live and trying to win over the population rather than, than destroy them. Something the U.S. learned in its counterinsurgencies. I think that's been lost. And I think the, the president needs to make clearer what American interests and American views on this issue are. Yeah, I think it would take a leader, like a real leader in the United States, to guide Israel from whatever is going to happen now. And that's going to be tremendously difficult, figuring out if it's not Hamas, then who is it? It might not even be the PA or it might not be Abu Mazen in the West Bank. But I would just say that it's not just the Arab population in the Middle East. There's a lot of unrest, I think, throughout the world about what's going on in Gaza, including the United States. I was just telling John that I met someone this weekend that has lost over 100 relatives so far. But on the, the Arab government side, I would say that there's a, as John was saying, a performative part of Arab diplomacy, especially on the Palestinian issue. So there are people like King Abdullah of Jordan that have to say something because half of his population is Palestinian. They neighbor Israel. But Gulf states that have normalized or want to would never be able to come out in full support of what Israel is doing. I mean, we have upwards of you know 3,000 children being killed. I don't think it's just because of unrest amongst their populations. It's because they know that their enemies will use this as an opportunity to take a dig at them. And so every day that goes by and more Palestinian bodies pile up, Gulf states have to somehow legitimize normalization with Israel. And that's going to be really difficult. And I think the likes of Qatar and others are going to use this every single day because it is devastating for the Arab world, for Palestinians. And I think it makes normalization in the future difficult that might continue, but certainly I don't think it's going to be as public. And Gulf states might feel like they need to do more than pay lip service to the Palestinian issue. I'm not sure, but certainly I think if events keep playing out this way, something has to change. Jumping off that, something that Neri also said that I've seen elsewhere is this idea that regional Arab states are likely going to be involved in Gaza post-war, either politically, diplomatically, financially, or even boots on the ground. How willing and able are regional Arab states to get involved in Gaza post-war, and what are the limits to their engagement? I think there's a lot they can do in terms of financial assistance and reconstruction. And frankly, they were giving quite a bit of financial assistance prior to October 7th. The larger issue is the political issue. As John has said many times before, no one wants to go into Gaza on Israeli tanks. That is not a legitimizing <laughs> illustration of power. So I think that, you know, in terms of, I was talking to somebody from a development agency this weekend. And they just, you know, were a bit flabbergasted because the 80 things that you would need for any kind of development program aren't possible in Gaza because of the political situation. They're not possible in the West Bank because of the political situation. So to a certain degree, telling people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, but cutting off the bootstraps is not going to really work. So there's going to have to be an enormous amount of international aid. But I think, again, the really complicating factor, as has always been the case, is going to be the political factor. And who do you empower? What kind of leader can come to play and actually speak to the hopes and aspirations of their people? Because as of yet, no Palestinian leader can really be legitimate because they can't do that. They don't do that. Well, Israelis are really not thinking about the fact that others will need to help them. I think Israelis are very focused on military operations right now. Military operations only tee you up for the much more important political governance issues. I think we all remember President Bush standing in front of the Mission Accomplished banner with the end of major combat operations in Iraq. And we were years and years and years away from actually being able to diminish the U.S. military presence in Iraq in a significant way. Nobody looks back at the Iraq war as a great victory. Israelis are used to looking at the military as producing great victories. I'm not sure that there is a great victory. I'm sure there's not going to be a great victory 
unless there's a way for Israel to move from where it is to having deep partnerships with both Arab governments and some element of a Palestinian government that is not merely subsidiary to Israel, but is negotiating for Palestinian rights from Israel. That's not where Israelis are. I don't know how long it's going to take Israelis to get there. But to me, this is a war that assumed that others would come in and fill the vacuum if Israel didn't want to. And I don't think any Arab government feels a necessity to save the Israelis from embarrassment, cost, violence, or anything else. I think Israel brought this on themselves. Israel can work its way out. And if Israel wants a different outcome, then Israel is going to have to act very differently from the way it's acted in the past. Natasha, you mentioned the political dynamics in the West Bank. Currently in the West Bank, Palestinian protesters are rallying against Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian National Authority. How do you foresee this war shifting politics in the West Bank? It's getting really ugly. We just saw a bunch of settlers go into the village of Susia and demand that they leave within 24 hours or they'd all be killed. So I would imagine that Palestinians are very, very scared in the West Bank about revenge attacks and things like that. And this will, again, I think, knock away the legitimacy of the PA and the security forces, which, as Neri was saying, are doing a great job of keeping this all together. But what we saw with Gaza is the limitations to the security-focused approach. I mean, ironically, I think it was Hamas and Abu Mazen that were the biggest winners of that security-focused approach for so long. Israel felt like if it could negotiate with the person on top, then they didn't have to deal with the millions of Palestinians underneath and those issues. And I think that this attack and what's been going on in the West Bank for some time now, where we've seen extreme militant groups come to the fore to try to fill that legitimacy void are coming. And I think there could be worse than Hamas. I think that's something that Israel hasn't really thought about yet. But I think if you, again, if you don't have a Palestinian leader that gains legitimacy because he's working for the hopes and aspirations of his people, like any other leader, you're going to have an enormous problem in the future. But it cuts two ways. On the one hand, you have some extremists in the Palestinian community. You have extremists in the Israeli community, including not just religious nationalists, so you have a lot of armed groups. It's not just defying the authority of the Palestinian Authority. It's defying the authority of the Israeli army. And you don't have the separation between communities that you have between, say, Gaza and Israel or Israel and the West Bank. And I think there are deep divisions inside the Israeli government as to what you do with the settlers of this viewpoint, issues of self-defense are both very real, but also very murky. And where's the boundary between self-defense and aggression? And it seems to me that as clear as the battle lines seem to be in Gaza, you have much, much, much blurrier battle lines in the West Bank. And this could collapse very, very quickly with challenges, not just to Palestinian Authority forces, but challenges to Israeli forces by people on each side who feel the stakes are not just about in this world, but in the world to come. And that becomes very, very dangerous for everybody. It's definitely a precarious situation that we will keep monitoring closely. Thank you both for joining me. Thank you, Leah. Thanks, Leah. Thanks for listening to Babel. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find more analysis on this topic linked in the show notes on the CSIS website, and you can find us on Twitter at CSIS Mideast. East.